Let me see here. Is there a flashlight? I have a page full of notes. I needn't be so... Uh, there's anything here that wasn't touched on. Well, some notes about um, the this in, this planetary intelligence. Thank you, June. Uh, and how all that works. Um, one of the insights that I've been reading different people this year. Maybe you can tell. And one of the people I've been reading is uh, Greg Egan, who I talked about yes. last year. Yes. But now I've read more. Yes. Now I've read Diaspora yes. and the ones where he makes no effort whatsoever to yes. explain it to you, unless you've already done your homework. And uh, what I and then Jonathan today, in his lecture, talked about DNA a little bit and frame slippage and all of that and it reminded me of it. The thing that I'm coming to from my psychedelic uh, experience and my life experience and the whole ball of wax is, uh, I've said for many, many years that the world is made of language. That was just sort of one of of my bumper stickers. But I think that there's a, a, that that carries some of the flavor of what I want to say there but that there's more to it than that. It's, it's that uh, everything is code. Everything is code in the sense that hackers mean when they say they write code. When Sasha stands up and waves his arms and draws what he calls the dirty pictures, he initiates you into a code a vocabulary with very uh, defined rules and quick to learn and then they're like tinker toys once you know the rules of the connectivity then you can sit down like a child and begin to stick these things together and say well what would this be like and what would this be like and does God allow this or (laughs) does this break the rules and so forth the DNA is like that human language is like that Uh, human body language is like that. Machines communicate like this. In fact, uh, uh, this is the a, a bridge which connects us. This is the great overarching bridge which will connect us to the machines that they, like us, are uh, commanded by language. And so... Uh, <laughs> this realization that everything is code and code moving on many levels is I think a further it's more primary than the perception for example that things are made of space time matter and energy that's one level below code the code codes for space time matter and energy it's much more like we're in a a simulacrum some kind of machine environment. And in fact, I like that idea because I've always sensed, and psychedelics have always intensified this intuition in me, that the universe is a puzzle. Life is a, is a problem to be solved. It's a conundrum. It's not what it appears to be. It, there, is a, there are doors. There are locks and keys. There are levels. Uh, and if you if you get it right, somehow it will give way to something extremely unexpected. DMT is a perfect example of that. And of course, at the molecular level, it literalizes that metaphor. I mean, the DM the DMT is the molecular key, the extraneous <coughs> object introduced into the front door of the synaptic receptor, and then. You know, you can plunder the palace for five minutes. Uh, <laughs> well, if if the if the world is uh, if the world is code, then um, it can be hacked. In other words, it won't. It needn't stand still in quite the same way that it stands still in your mind if you believe in something called the laws of physics. Uh, it permits magic because it says behind the laws of physics is a deeper level 
And if you can reach that deeper level, you can make uh, you can make changes there. Uh, oh, and this leads on to something that I wanted to say about an earlier theme, where I was talking about the legitimation of the of the community's intuitions. It's something that we always kick around at these things, or I always bring it up in some form, is where do the hallucinations come from? Uh, we arrived late last night after a 24-hour trip from Hawaii that was just hell, <laughs> or as much hell as modern airlines can legally inflict upon us. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and uh, you know, got stoned, and then we, so we were laying there, and uh, the, it always happens when you know you're cut off from cannabis for long periods like that. <laughs> that uh, <laughs> we turn to it; it's ten times as strong. Yeah. And the hallucinations were exquisite. And you know, I've been looking at hallucinations now for <laughs> thirty some years. And and I looked at these last night, and I thought, if someone would ask me what were they like, what would I have to say? And I had said, indescribable, mm. indescribable. And I looked and looked, and I could look to my heart's content, and they were in, uh, indescribable. So we always come around to this question, uh, where do the hallucinations come from? And I suppose the unconscious reductionists among us, and I don't mean that they're unconscious, I mean that they unconsciously use reductionism, mm -hmm. uh, probably <laughs> assume that... It's some kind of like iteration thing that bits and pieces of everything you've ever seen are rolling in some kind of neurological kaleidoscope that can run forever <laughs> and just produce this endless download of drifting mm -hmm. imagery. But there's a problem with that because this stuff is too coherent, it means too much, it's too emotionally charged. <laughs> well, we have never really rallied as a group to try and locate in our uh, up in our combined opinions the one or several sources of these images and uh, I think that uh, and I talked a bit about this last year but I think this is legitimate perception of of uh, Thoughts, places, things, times, and objects that either have existed somewhere in the universe, or do exist, or have existed in the minds of beings somewhere, sometime, <laughs> in the universe. In other words, that we have to begin to take seriously the consequences of generalizations like quantum connectivity. In other words, it's one thing to bask in the light of the overarching metaphor, which says everything is connected to everything else. It's quite another thing to say, and so then what are the consequences for me of this? And the answer seems to me to be that, in, that the imagination, the inside of our heads, really is the most vast frontier mm -hmm. imaginable. And we must leave it for future generations, or maybe not generations, but future evolutionary biologists to figure out why an animal nervous system would evolve a propensity for accessing Bell non-local data, in other words, quantum mechanically uh, accessible data at a different level of the physics of things. There must be a reason and in the same way that the problem of speciation posed a problem for 19th century biology, this can pose a problem to our thinking without it sinking our intellectual enterprise. It is for some more sophisticated future group of thinkers to understand why this is so. What we have to grapple with is that it is so. Mm -hmm. That it is so. That... Uh, you know, you have the Hubble telescope inside of you. Uh, you have inside of you an informational gathering instrument that can give you good intelligence about things so immeasurably distant from this point that to state it in numbers and units is meaningless. 